Good morning everyone, my name's Sam, I'm the lab manager for HIDAC in the UK. Uh, as you can see, I've chosen a very attractive title, um, MPC versus the differences observed between particle count data at 20 degrees and 80 degrees. Um, yeah, it's a very, very exciting title, um, but in terms of what we're actually going to do today, uh, I'm going to give obviously a brief introduction of myself, of HIDAC, of the laboratory, uh, things that we do. Varnish is, is really the main topic, that's where the MPC comes from, so it's all about oil oxidation products, the degradation of the fluids, how that happens, um, with a key focus on electrostatic discharge as well, most people have heard of this, but um, really how is it caused, some of the mechanisms of build-up. Then we'll talk about particle counting, again a topic which has been done and done and done, but we just want to get everyone on the same level, ready for the research task, which was really looking at uh, the degradation itself and then trying to use particle counting at two different temperatures as a verification process for the testing for varnish potential, varnish buildup in the system. Uh, and then yeah, hopefully we'll have a bit of time for some questions at the end. So HIDAC then, so we're a global corporation. Um, most people have probably heard of us because we're pretty much involved in absolutely everything. Um, 9,000 employees worldwide with a, a main headquarters in, in Germany based in Saarbrücken. I'm not going to go through this completely, but in terms of what we do, I mean, you can see everything, accumulator technology, hydraulic systems, services, whether it's lab services or, uh, or, or industrial services, process filtration and, and so on and so forth. Obviously a lot of filtration as well. In the UK, we're based in Whitney, so down in Oxfordshire. Uh, that's where our main headquarters are. And in the UK, we've got about just over 125 employees now, uh, split over two sites. So the main one is in Whitney. And um, we have our older facility, which is in Childbury, which is just down the road, a small little rural village area, um, where we have some of the old machining going on and assembly, things like that. So a bit about myself. Um, that's me, looking very dapper in a lab coat. Um, so I've worked in HIDAC now for about five and a half years, and it's always been in the lab itself. Um, so it's a bit of an honor for me, actually, to get out and see the sun. Um, sun, a bit, bit dubious, but... Um, I started off as a, a trainee lab technician and I've really sort of grown side by side with the lab, with both my knowledge and the, the lab's knowledge sort of growing together. Uh, my background is more science based, so it's more in a, a science based education focusing on chemistry. Um, but I'm really looking now to sort of try and develop a, a link between these reports that you see, these oil analysis reports, which sometimes look like a lot of numbers, um, and then trying to actually interpret that and, and make it more readable for engineering. Um, and it's included a couple of hydraulic training courses provided here at the NFPC. Looking at Graham, actually, very good. I'd recommend them. <laughs> um, so, introduction to the, the lab itself. So, it was originally established back in the 90s as a very rudimental base of um, contamination control. So, um, some patch testing and some particle counting. I think the particle counting didn't even have uh, any printers or digital readouts, it was all had to all be electronically set up and, and data fed somewhere else. So, very rudimental stuff. Um, since then, obviously, we've gone through many changes to staff, equipment, the site itself. Uh, the greatest renovation being in 2015. So, this isn't from the 90s, you see it's a bit more modern. This was uh, before the change in 2015. We used to have kitchen worktops basically, and now we've gone to chemically resistant and fume cupboards. and. Very nice, brand spanking. It does not look like this anymore. This was just after uh, renovation. It's nowhere near as white now. Um, so yeah, the lab I've mentioned already. It's mentioned. It's built. Uh, sorry, it's based in the UK in the Whitney facility, and we consider it really the ex centre of excellence. So for everything fluid care, it's the department that I'm in, looking at um, conditioning, condition monitoring, filtration, that side of things. So what do we actually do in the lab? So we've got this lab, what do we do in it? Majority of what we do is fluid analysis. So different fluids, so we've got oils, um, so be it standard um, mineral uh, lubricants, hydraulic oils, um, typical group one, group two, group three oils. Um, we do fire resistant fluids, so your more specialist stuff, your glycols, your phosphate esters, um, anything of that nature. We look at aviation fluids, so things like Skydrol. Nasty stuff. Um, fuels, so again, typically looking at diesel, but any fuel we'll take a look at, petrol or kerosene or anything liquid-based really. Uh, and water as well, so looking at processed water or cooling water applications, we have testing available for that. Not so much um, the, the te your, your standard testing water of bacterial side of things, um, much more just the, um, the contamination levels and, and looking at it from that perspective. 
Um, apart from the fluid analysis then, we also do uh, used filter analysis, so being filter manufacturers it makes sense for us to look at these filters from time to time. You can imagine if the filters aren't performing correctly or they're blocking quickly, we're the first ones to hear about it. So we get the filter back and we almost do a post-mortem on the filter if you will, cut it open, take a look at the contamination inside, is it acting correctly, reasons why it might be blocking, any formations of grease or de deposits or um, even any signs of uh, varnish, which is what we're talking about, oxidation products. Um, and lastly, we also do component cleanliness services, so more for you guys in, in mobile or automotive applications. You may have um, uh, requirements for suppliers, or you might be a part supplier. In that case, you may have suppliers who are requesting your parts to be supplied at a certain cleanliness. We help them write the standards, we help them do the actual testing. Um, there's a lot of growth in, in that area as well, as, as obviously further development continues. I mentioned already, we're very much a support laboratory, so we're a small, dedicated team, so um, just the three of us, and we get very hands-on with the samples. We're not a big automated sample farm, which do hundreds of thousands of samples, run it through automated equipment, and print out a list at the end. Um, we want to be hands-on, we want to be able to see how your oil is filtering for a filter membrane, we want to see those particle counts with ourselves, be able to interpret it all, and, and have that communication with you guys. So it's much more support function. Um, we do do dedicated contractual work as well, for people that do find that side of things more interesting, um, but obviously the, that the growth is, is, is coming from that side of things because as you can imagine there's three of us doing intensive hard work, uh, manual work rather than a lot of automation, there's only a certain amount that we can do at the moment. Uh, and yeah, a lot of the work we do then is very tailored to the customers, whether it's the testing itself, so we may develop our own standards if there isn't one available, so for the filter elements for example, that's internal, we do water saturation curves according to our own internal standards as well. Um, so we're able to develop other, other test uh, methods available, um, but obviously for the majority of stuff we'll do it according to whatever standard ISO or ASTM method you require. And it also means we can do bespoke analysis reports, so for example we can do trending reports, we always pretty much always include the image of the patch membrane, people like to see pictures, they like to see the contamination that's actually included, um, and it really helps to verify the particle counts that we do as well. Yeah, being allowed with this nature obviously gives us the opportunity to do research tasks and obviously one of them is, is what I'm actually going to end up talking about in this presentation. So varnish then, is that really the right word to use or, or what is it? And everyone's a bit up in the air about it all. Well, really it's just a, a generic term that's used anyway. Um, it's other also going to be called as, uh, referred to as oil oxidation products. Um, it's becoming a very hot topic at the moment and there's many reasons for that. Um, different changes to oil types and different requirements of, of industry and also smaller clearances, same as contamination, we're seeing these problems. Um, but yeah, you might, might hear it called that, you might hear me call it, refer to it as sludge as well throughout this, because effectively that's all it is. Varnish is somewhat confusing, um, it gets called that because of the colour of it, severely. So like I said, sludge-like material can develop in nearly every hydraulic application and it's typically seen as a, a yellowy-brown coating or deposit. Um, so this is sort of a, a brass look to it. Typical contamination or typically saturated filters um, you may just see oil saturation or you may see bits of black contamination but seeing a, a typical sheen, a brassy sheen is a, a kind of an indication of varnish formation. Um, but it also, this is where it's confusing because it also could appear black if it is very heavily uh, oxidised or if there is other contamination mixed in with the, um, in with the varnish, the oxidation products. And I'm mentioning this here, varnish has been determined as a polar material. So what we mean by that in terms of polarity is looking at the chemistry side of things. It means typically um, oil oxidation products, varnish molecules, have an imbalanced charge. So one side of the molecule will be more heavily positive, one will be more negatively, uh, negatively charged. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because polarity has something to do with the solubility as well. So polar will mix with polar and nonpolar will mix with nonpolar. Um, and because of that, it, it just It'll, it'll make more sense in a little bit, but I'm just letting you know now. Varnish is typically polar in nature. So what actually is it then? Like I said, it's a generic term used to describe deposits formed by base oil, oil degradation. Um, as the hydraulic lubricating fluids age, I've used the term loosely because it's not age in terms of years, it's really in terms of its remaining useful life. Um, but as it ages, the molecules will break up. And then once these are broken up, they conglomerate, start sticking to each other and other contaminants. Uh, you may not be able to see it, typically when the system's running warm it will dissolve, it's very much like water in that sense. The hotter the oil, the more capacity for varnish to stay suspended in the solution or dissolved in the oil. 
Um, but in cold spots or during shutdowns, the varnish can drop out. So if you have varnish issues or oxidation issues, you might see them at coolers, um, any cold elbows in the system, or again, if you're shutting the system down, you ever start it up again and have uh, judders or issues with sticking valves, that may not always be, but it is a good chance that it is a result of oxidation products or, or varnish. So what causes it? We mentioned this aging. What causes this premature aging, this premature breaking of the molecules in the formation of the sludge? Process is referred to as oxidation, which simply describes the reaction of something with oxygen. So it's an oxidation process. There are some key contributing factors. So contamination in the form of water, um, particles and, and gas. It makes sense in terms of gas. If you have more oxygen available for reaction, there's going to be more of that taking place. Um, high pressure and temperature system parameters, if you're running incorrect system parameters or if the oil isn't suitable for the system parameters, um, you may see issues. So temperature is an interesting one. Um, so there's the Arrhenius rule which states that for every 10 degrees increase you double the rate of reaction. That applies here as well if you're running 10 degrees hotter than you should be for the fluid type. Um, you may double the rate of oxidation occurring, the, the rate of sludge formation. Electrostatic discharges as well, I'll go into in a little bit more detail because it's, I think it's cool, it's quite an interesting one. Um, so it's the actual sparking within the system and, and how that contributes to the, the formation. And we also have additive depletion, so you have additives within your oil typically nowadays that will be focused on preventing this from occurring, so they'll be called antioxidant additives. Um, and their job is to react with the um, oxygen to, to take that place and then obviously it extends the lifetime of the oil. Um, but it stands to reason that if they get depleted and you run out of antioxidants, then your, your oil is going to be the focus of oxidation. UV light as well, a uh, bit of an interesting one, just what I mentioned. It's obviously less relevant to your system as it's all closed, but if you are going to take a sample and have um, the level of oxidation measured, UV light can actually heavily contribute to the continuous oxidation process. So if you take a sample, you leave it out on, on the sun for a few days or on the windowsill, we don't get much sun, but even a bit of UV will, will contribute. Um, so we did some studies in-house where we left some you know, in a bench cupboard or, or, or hidden from sunlight. Um, one, one out in sunlight, even within weeks we were going from good levels or okay levels of oxidation to action and critical levels. So um, you, can, you can heavily influence your sample results um, just by how you keep hold of them. Um, so we would obviously recommend putting them in bags or, or boxes or whatever it is you're using just to shield it from UV as well. Um, chem chemical incompatibilities as well, whether it's mixing fluids or introduction of some people will put in new additives, it's not heavily recommended, but if you're doing that sort of thing then you may run the risk of this incompatibility causing varnishes and greases. So electrostatic discharge, what is ESD? A bit easier to say, what is ESD? Um, it's a phenomenon where discharge is then obviously occurring within the system. Typically that takes at the filter housing itself. So here's obviously a, a clear housing that we developed in order to show this off. This here is sparking taking place at a filter. Um, what is the issue with that? What does the sparking actually do? Well, it causes the following problems. It burns holes in the filter media, as you can see here, there's sort of a, you might be able to see a 200 micron filter, uh, a hole in the filter. Um, so if you have a 10 micron filter and you're blowing 200 micron holes in it, obviously it's not going to be functioning uh, as efficiently at all. Everything's going to flow through the path of least resistance. Um, obviously the main point of this presentation is the varnish formation. It can also damage the oil, contributing to that. Also, there may be some um, migration of sparks, so there's instances where if the filters have attempted to be made conductive to prevent the um, discharge from taking place at the filter, just conducting the filter doesn't solve the issue. It can cause the spark to then occur elsewhere. So this is where you may see occasions of sparking in the tank or even examples of jumping off of pipework to the floor as it's trying to ground itself, wherever. Um, but yeah, that's obviously a bit, more <laughs> a bit more catastrophic, a bit more concern there. So what actually causes it? Um, well, it's typically caused when the oil and the filter become electrostatically charged. So this is a, a little bit more in depth on the chemistry side of things, but it occurs when the oil and the filter becomes charged and uh, that happens because of electron migration or electron transfer. So electrons are subatomic, negatively charged particles, um, and this electron transfer will take place typically um, between different materials according to this, the triboelectric series. So 
The easiest way for me to describe this is to put an example of every, pretty much everyone's done the thing with their hair in the balloon and you've had your hair standing up and you've, you know, you've, you've, you've got your hair standing up through static charging or you've rubbed your socks on the ground and zapped someone or you, you, felt, a, you felt a static shock before. Well typically that's due to materials of this nature. Then naturally one is more willing to receive electrons and one's more willing to donate um, and this will occur naturally. So you've got hair here for example and then balloons down here. Um, just to put it in an easy perspective. In terms of oil, oil is very much, um, effectively it's like a liquid plastic, so it's down here in this PVC range. Um, and then your typical filter media is a glass fiber. So you've got glass at the top. So your, your filter is more likely to want to charge positive. So it will be the one donating the negative particle to the oil. Uh, and this is what we've seen here. Uh, as that occurs, you get an increased voltage, and once the voltage occurs past a certain level, so three kilovolts per millimeter, then you can start to see this discharge sparking. So I have got a quick video just to show this. So it's currently flowing through the right-hand side filter, so it's Hydax Stat Free Media, and then you'll see as it changed over to our old media, the typical glass fiber media, you can see the actual sparking taking place. Obviously this has been simulated with very low conductivity oil, um, very high workload at the filter. Stop that. <laughs> very high um, workload at the filter, so that's very, um, con it's a very big contribution as well. So I'll talk about conductivity and oils, but also the workload. So if you have, um, I think it's greater than 0.1 liters per centimeter squared per minute flow through the filter and a, and a very low conductive oil, then your risk of this sparking taking place is, is increased. Um, yes, so that's why I think it's cool. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, I mentioned the role of conductivity of the oil, how that actually impacts ESD. Well, high conductivity oils are less prone to electrostatic discharge, typically greater than 500 picosiemens per meter. And this was typically group one base oils. So you may have seen the, the chart of base oils. We've had group one, uh, some of the older oils, which are pulled out of the ground with uh, a lot of zinc heavy elements um, and a lot of conductive elements as it turned out. So again, zinc and also the nature of the molecule, molecules of the oil, these were more polar. So they were more, uh, more charge carriers. Um, as we've refined the fluids, as we've made them better for industry, more lubricant, lub yeah, more lubricant capable or, or better at lubricating. Um, as that's occurred and we've also tailored the additive packages, um, the conductivity as a side effect is lowered. Um, so now we might see typically less than 500 picosiemens per meter, uh, sometimes as low as, you know, I've seen three or four picosiemens, which is almost guaranteed a risk of discharging. And that's the group two and three base oils that we're seeing now. Uh, and most oils that you are going to get now are going to be groups two and three. Um, so, you know, you can measure conductivity in a, a lab environment uh, and then if you have that knowledge, you could then try to determine the workload of the filter that I mentioned. If it's greater than 0.1 liters per centimeter squared per minute, then you might have that discharge taking place. I mentioned more refined additives. The other reason, obviously, for the change was environmental reasons. Um, disposal of the fluid is, is better when there's less carcinogens and, and heavy metals and zinc. So zinc is why you hear ash containing or ash-free oils as well. It basically refers to zinc presence. <coughs> So what, how does that sparking actually cause the varnish to occur? How does that translate to sludge? Well, it's quite simple. The temperature of these sparks is over 10,000 degrees. You imagine that local burning, that local heating, causes the oil molecules to crack. Uh, and the cracking molecules call, call, form something called free radicals. And radicals are just very highly reactive molecules. Um, so if you imagine, again, an oil chain, a, a very straight carbon chain, if it gets split up, then these free radicals are going to want to react with absolutely anything to try and return to a stable place. So they'll react with other oil molecules, oxygen in the oil, other radicals, um, water in the oil, other contaminants that we've mentioned. Uh, and it basically spins off this giant chain uh, of reactions until you have oxidation products which will then conglomerate and form the sludge-like material that we call varnish. So this is probably the, this is the easiest reason to say it's a bit odd to call it varnish because varnish is a very generic term. If you're a chemist, you're going to be a bit upset with that use because each oil oxidation product is going to be very different in terms of chemical nomenclature. But, but for us, in terms of what we need to know and, and see, uh, we know that it's an oxidation product and we know that it's a sludge forming and we can say we can put it under the branch of, of varnish. I'm fine with that. <laughs>
Some uh, example images. Um, so I mentioned the uh, uh, Spark migration, the charge migration throughout the system. This is an example where we've had a f uh, filter which has been um, made conductive, so probably had some sort of steel fused into the media, um, and that has then caused the charge to carry on um, and discharge at the tank, where it's ignited the oil mist vapor, exploded out through the breather, burnt the filter material, or burnt the breather. Um, obviously, if the case is just a burnt breather, that's not such a, well, it's a, it's a concern, but if that's all that's happened, that's okay. But if you consider the health and safety risks involved with that, it is, uh, it is concerning. Example of burnt filter material, so you can see the carbon deposits as it's been burnt. Example of varnish forming on oil cooler fins, so if you imagine, I said already, it's more likely to drop out in cold spots, um, but if you consider this sludge is starting to form on your cooler, you're going to reduce your heat exchange efficiency, which increases the temperature, which acts as a cyclic effect and increases the rate of oxidation and varnish formation. So. It's a very exponential process. Um, yeah, some examples of varnish deposition on the gear teeth can really reduce um, clearances and, and, and cause issues. Uh, another brief, this one I think runs within the presentation. A brief presentation I just want to show, just to put some images to it. So this is your oil molecules here. These are all very non-polar now, they're very linear. Um, and this might be your, I don't know, your filter surface or your tank surface. Oil aging as a result of anything that I've mentioned can cause the uh, oil to just to break up, which forms these radicals, these um, beginning of oil aging products. It's interesting because they will actually act, try to act non-polar within the oil to stay suspended. So you'll see in just a second. Here they, they line up to form, it's called dimers, and uh, they will um, basically try and recreate non -polar, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, try and recreate non-polar materials in order to do that. Um, and here we can see cold spots, so metal surfaces, or um, even if it just gets so heavily saturated, it's going to start dropping out. So say this is in your tank or at your filter or on a valve in particular, in a small servo valve or something with very low tolerances. It's going to build up, going to affect your functionality, going to cause sticking valves, um, as well as obviously it's a very big indication that your oil isn't going to last much longer. You're, lo you're using it up and losing the um, lubricant qualities. Why is it a problem? I've alluded to a couple of reasons. Um, malfunctioning valves, blockage of filters. Filters uh, such as this, are, uh, they work through depth filtration. So there are multiple layers. It's not a simple, um, just like a square matrix or anything. There's multiple layers of filtration that will, um, will work to capture um, particles in different stages and nets. Well, if you consider with varnish, it's a very sticky conglomeration and it just sticks to the outside of the filter and it just blinds that one filter, so you will suddenly see your filter go from, I don't know, months of lifetime down to we've had days or weeks, um, just as it blocks and constantly replacing is a very expensive way of, <laughs> of removing the varnish, especially if it keeps building up anyway. Reducing lubrication gaps, increase of friction and temperature, bearing wear, obstruction of heat transfer, I've covered those already. So what do we do about it? How do we prevent it from happening in the first place? And is there any way of getting rid of it once it's there? Well, pretty much the opposite of what I've said in terms of how it occurs in the first place. Keep your oil clean, keep it dry. Um, we'd obviously recommend stat-free filtration. The thing is about the HIDAC, I'm, I'm not a sales guy, but the thing is about the HIDAC filters is um, that instead of causing them to discharge elsewhere in the system by becoming conductive, we've actually m modified the filter material so that it's similar to the oil on the triboelectric series. So that stops the electron transfer from taking place in the first place and it nullifies the actual risk of charge building up. So it's not like the charge is still building up and gets dispersed elsewhere, it just doesn't build up in the first place, at least not the filter. Uh, the correct oil viscosity is very important. If you're using the too thick oil or too viscous oil, um, you think everything's going to be working harder, your pump, your motor is going to be working harder, your temperature is going to be raised, and then you're going to have the issue of varnish formation. The correct system parameters, temperature, pressure, sufficient cooling, big enough cooling units. Um, lab testing as well, so I would say this, being a, a lab manager, I recommend using a lab to monitor the oxidation um, process or, or progress within the oil, um, seeing how it's occurring. And obviously if it's cost effective to do so, then the oil can be reclaimed. If you have low volumes of oil, it may not be worth doing this. It may be worth identifying the root cause and seeing why is it happening? Am I having too high temperature? Am I running, have I got any hot spots or any malfunctioning coolers or anything like that that I've mentioned or is ESD a risk? 
Um, but if you have large volumes of oil and you can't get to the bottom of this root cause, then there are ways of removing the varnish. So again, a lot of, the, lot of these units are out there, varnish removal units. We have the VMU and the VEU. One, the VEU works with a resin-based adsorption technology, and the other one simply offlines the, the oil um, and cools it right down, um, very low flow, cools it down, and then all of the varnish comes out of solution, gets captured on much cheaper cellulose filters rather than your in-house cartridge filters, which are going to be very costly and less efficient. So actually measuring the level of varnish, um, we use MPC testing, obviously that's in the title. Um, what it does is uh, we take the oil itself, we mix it 50-50 with a solvent um, after a few days prep, um, and then it gets run through a 0.45 micron filter membrane, and this is what you get left with. Um, the color of that is then analyzed with a spectrophotometer, and all that really does is tell you how brown it is or how dark it is. So it takes three values, the luminance, how bright it is, the a and B values, which are the yellowness and the redness values, and yellow and red and darkness is brown. Um, and that is uh, the contributing factor, and it gives you this MPC scale. The darker the patch, it makes sense that there's more potential then for varnish to build up on bearings, valves, or wherever. I would say as well now that there are alternative methods that you could use to detect um, varnish build up sooner. So you could, instead of, you can imagine that this is actually if we're seeing this, you've already got the problem. You're already seeing the, the issue. Um, I mentioned antioxidant additives earlier. Um, if you can measure the depletion of these antioxidant additives, which are combating this formation, then that is a, a very good way of doing that. So that's a, something called a ruler test, a remaining useful life evaluation routine, which looks at the amines and the phenols, which are your typical antioxidant additives, and it will give you a percentage remaining useful life. Um, again, this is specifically looking at mineral-based uh, lube oils. Um, but yeah, it's becoming a very widely used uh, technique. So that was mostly on varnish, and now briefly on particle counting, because I know a lot of you have seen this before. Um, but typically, the measurement of contamination is also known as particle distribution measurement, and that's because we don't just look at the size of them, we look at how many particles there are. Uh, different ways of doing it, optical sensors, which is what we've used for this study, patch testing, um, so yeah, literally just pulling, a particles for, uh, pulling the oil through a patch and looking at what's left. So you can compare this image to known, uh, known images to give you a rough guide, or you can do an ISO 4407 which is um, someone, some poor soul has to sit down at a microscope and physically count particles with a clicker. Um, not torture that I subject any of my guys to in the lab, which is very nice of me. Um, gravimetric, so we look at the weight of contamination. Very useful, but obviously there may be issues. Um, if you had a high gravimetric, it may not mean a lot of contamination. It could mean you have one big piece of swarf or something, or, or something like that that's contributing to that weight. The results then get assigned different values according to standards. So this is where you get your ISO code and NAS and SAE classes, are your very common ones. But there are obviously other military standards out there and, uh, and aviation standards, things like that. So we look at ISO 4406, which is the three digit um, classification system. Size ranges are f greater than four, greater than six, and greater than 14 microns. Each of the ranges is counted and then it gets assigned a scale depending on how many particles there are at re each range. Um, and then that gets represented as a three code classification. So the first co code, so say, say here for example, 18, 16, 13, 18 refers to greater than four microns. And here we can see from the standard, uh, greater than 1,300, less than 2,500 particles per milliliter of oil. You can see why we have a code system because it becomes a nightmare just <laughs> talking about you have 2,346 particles at this size range and it doesn't become easily comparable, or translatable. Um, so that's the, the standard, the actual sensor principles and the technology for counting. So like I said, I'm looking at optical sensors. So you have a flow of oil in, clear, in a clear pathway with a light source on one side, a receiver diode on the other. So the light source um, could be a laser, it could be an LED. Um, these will vary depending on product and accuracy. Uh, as the particle goes past, you block that light source. Um, that gets registered by the photodiode, and that gets referred to as a shading principle. Literally, as a shadow is cast, the, the particle is counted. It gets repeated thousands or millions of times to give you a particle count. Uh, and they come in different shapes and sizes, RFCU 8000, for example. Um, and again, like different light sources. So we have a, a laser um, instead of an LED. It, all it really means is that we could theoretically count right down to ISO 0000. Which I have never seen, especially not from bottle samples. We've never got anywhere near. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's it's more for aerospace and medical purposes in that sense. 
So advantages and disadvantages of particle counting, very accurate. Um, obviously, we can't argue about what it says in terms of actually what it says. We can argue over what the results mean, but it's objective data. Um, can be calibrated to different standard, ISO 446, NAS, SAE, whatever it might be. Um, small length of time required to perform the testing, and obviously a good benefit is it can be done online. Um, particle counting online, if in many ways, will give you a much better indication than by the time you've tried to take a representative sample and get it through to the lab, um, you can get a very real-time um, feedback. Results, some of the negatives then, the results can be affected by things like water or air oxidation. So if you have a saturated oil with water, you won't be able to get an accurate particle count because the moisture will block the laser and it will refract and it will be, yeah, won't be very uh, clear. Um, in terms of air as well, bubbles will do the same thing. Oxidation, I'm putting it down as a negative, but for this case of the study here, it's actually a good thing that we can measure oxidation through particle counting. Um, and, and also it's a bit, it's an interesting one because it is still contamination in the sense that it is, <laughs> it is an um, unwanted um, particulate and it can be a solid particulate within the sample. Um, it's just interesting because it also can be dissolved in the oil, so it's a bit different. Um, it doesn't provide any details giving information on the contamination type, so it won't tell you if it's metal or fibres or anything like that. Um, it's where you need to do some patch testing and more investigative work. It can be high, high cost for these particle counters and there may be some fluid compatibility issues. Once things like water glycols start to con condensate, um, then you tend to get some sporadic readings. Um, yeah. So the actual particle counting of varnish, this is a bit where the polarity comes in that I mentioned earlier. So it does kind of depend on the solubility of the fluid as well, which is why we're starting to see varnish uh, a bit more in, in these modern fluids. So varnish is a polar material. I mentioned that these group two and group three oils are non-polar. Even though they're more resistant with their antioxidant additives to varnish formation, once the varnish has formed, it's less easily suspended within the oil. So the varnish is polar, group two, three oils typically non-polar. This is them trying to act non-polar still, so varnish molecules or, or radicals um, creating a micelle, trying to act non-polar, but these become very heavy. Um, and once that occurs, they drop out of solution, perform that sludge, start sticking to each other and sticking to walls. And that's the stuff that we can see when we're particle counting. And that can give us some very odd looking results. So a particle count of 23, 18, 12, for example, if you haven't, if you hadn't done much particle counting, which I have done a lot of particle counting, um, if you haven't done much, then it might not seem odd, but really we're looking at such a huge difference between the smaller range and the large range. Granted, it may be other reasons. There may just be filtration at a certain micron rating, which is taking out all the large particles. So there is, there is a bit of um, reading to be done into that. But if you're having a very high level of fine contamination with some huge jumps, then it can suggest that the smaller stuff is actually caused by the conglomerations of varnish that are starting to force. Because you imagine they still start off with submicron, and then when they start to congeal, they only start to form small particles still. So they don't tend to affect the larger ranges. So the actual research that we did, what, do we, what were we doing in the study and what am I actually talking about here today? Now we've gone through varnish and particle counting. Well, we looked at the correlation, if there was any, between MPC testing, which I mentioned. This here is an, an example of the scale I've said. So we count the, the MPC value, which is a combination of those three factors that I mentioned, light, yellow, red. Um, and then we get low MPC, which would be 0 to 30. OK, not too bad. Action, 30 to 50. Need to consider doing some changes. Critical, over 50. Need to consider um, re uh, conditioning the oil or replacing the fluid, depending on what's more cost effective. And also then differences observed between the particle count data at 20 degrees and 80 degrees C. The idea of this was that it would be a very useful verification process for MPC testing. Um, I'll go on to that just now. So the hypothesis, the, the thought behind it was that fresh oil samples, so uh, samples that are brand new or samples with low MPC values will have, uh, also have very negligible differences between the particle count at 20 and 80. Whereas we thought that samples with a high MPC value, lots of oxidation, would, we would then see a big difference between the counts at the two temperatures. For example, maybe we would see 22, 20, 15 at 20 degrees and it would drop down to 19, 18, 15 at 80 degrees. The idea of that was that at the higher temperature, the oxidization or the oxygen project, uh, products would dissolve back into the oil and you would no longer count them. The laser would go right through them or they would be suspended in the oil. Um, we did also take into account, we did think that there would be some uh, examples where this wouldn't occur, where we'd have a high MPC value and that would then uh, not be reflected in the particle counts. The idea then is that the darkness of the MPC membrane is purely due to normal contaminants or other colours. So you may have staining or sooting or uh, just carbon deposits which aren't a result of oxidation um, buildup. 
So what did we do? So we got 100 real oil samples from a variety of applications. So we had power generation, pulp and paper, oil manufacturers, injection molding, many, many more. Um, lots of different applications to get a wide variety of um, of use and, and a look at the entire uh, range and then each of the samples was subject to the MPC and to the particle counting. Results were then plotted as MPC versus difference, percentage difference between the number of particles greater than 4 microns. So we're looking at all the, all the particles here. And this was the ultimate result. So um, this is uh, the MPC value, so the colour of that filter membrane, and then this was the difference um, between the number of particles. So a negative uh, value indicates that the particles decreased as the temperature increased. So as you can see, as the MPC value increased, the overall um, trend does show that the number of particles greater than 4 microns did decrease more for these more heavily oxidised products. Of course there are some outliers which are uh, a bit different um, and, and we've obviously alluded to some of the reasons for that but some of the really interesting points here is uh, if you look at less than 30 MPC say or even less than 20 the number of um, particle counts where there was absolutely zero difference between um, the 20 degree count and the 80 degree count um, is this is where all the all the trend is really being collated. There's no difference and that's because there is no oxidation products in the oil and that's really shown off um, in that case. And again, the number of particles down here uh, is, is very large. So the conclusion, so the, the overall findings, we suggested that the MP, as the MPC value increases, the number of particles did decrease uh, compared at 80 degrees compared to 20. Some of the data was much more extreme. We had an example of um, 23, 18, uh, sorry, 23, 16, 8 at 20 degrees, all the way down to 13, 11, 7. So this, you would say, is completely unacceptable for modern hydraulics. This is perfectly clean and almost unreachable in most applications. Um, so that was an MPC value of 62 as well. So we could see a lot of oxidation products, and now we can say actually most of that was oxidation products. It wasn't other contaminants, um, and the method of removal won't be through standard filtration. It may be varnish removal units or even um, other requirements to identify the root cause of this um, oxidation buildup, varnish buildup. And there were other data where it contradicted our hypothesis. We had 14, 12, 9, for example, at 20 degrees, and it even went up to 15, 13, 9 at 80 degrees. Um, and that was an MPC value of 44. So it's quite a high MPC. It's on the upper range, and you'd expect there to be a lot of oxidation products. You expect it to go down. But in these cases, we're concluding that the colour of the filter was due to uh, other, other reasons, so particulates within the oil um, or, just, or simply from staining of the membrane. So it does show that although MPC is great, um, there is some limitations, and this is why we're, we're sort of suggesting this further, further test is important. So the summary, oxidation products varnish is a serious threat to machinery uh, it do, and it does need to be uh, monitored appropriately through the, through, through the tests I've mentioned today. Others are of, of course available, there's a huge range of oil analysis um, techniques out there. The MPC is a very reasonable measure of the varnish potential within a system, but we do think further verification of it is important as it can be very sporadic and it may take into account things that aren't oxidation products. Um, one of these obviously being the particle count that I've suggested, that's a good option. So we can say if a high MPC value of companies are decreasing the particle count, that's effectively confirming the presence of varnish. Overall, what we're saying is if you do more testing, you get more knowledge and you have more control over your system, a greater understanding of any issues you have, um, yeah, just more control. And that was it. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, do you have any questions? I realised I was very quick, actually, then. Given the impact of temperature, could you increase the life cycle by moving to synthetic oils? Uh, to be more resistant to the temperature buildup. Yeah. yeah, so this is what I'm saying, is that, yeah, these, these more uh, modern synthetic oils, which will be able to prevent oxidation from taking place, they will do that to a certain degree, but because, again, because of the nature of them being um, non-polar, when the oxidation products do build up, which they will do inevitably eventually, then they will be, start to show <coughs> signs of that more quickly. You'll see the symptoms quicker. They'll fall out of the solution quicker. Um, but in terms of yeah, in terms of um, yeah, in terms of what you're saying for the uh, the extending the lifetime, yes, it would extend. They would extend the actual lifetime. The antioxidant additives would help to combat that for a longer period of time. Okay. Yes. You mentioned the importance uh, more recently of the effect of the UV value mm. on the NPC result. Uh, the latest ASTM standard dash 16 specifies that one should use dark opaque bottles when taking the sample to eliminate the effect of UV and also when you're heating the sample to use it in a confined area. Mm -hmm.
have you addressed that issue? Yeah. Laboratory? Yeah, well, our, our lab is actually in the middle of the building, so I don't see any sun throughout the day. So there, there's that, but in terms of the, the control of the um, MPC Valley in the first place, like I said, we always provide um, UV-resistant bags, boxes to store the samples in, and when it comes to start sample storage, um, the confinement of the sample during preparation. So if you've read the standard, you know that it needs to go through an oven procedure where it sits in the oven for three days um, at, uh, I think it's 60 degrees C. Uh, sits in the oven for three days. It's a conditioning process um, because if you imagine if you take your sample um, and it's very cold um, and if you bring it into a lab and they do the test straight away at that temperature, well, it's gonna, all this varnish is going to be fresh in solution. It's going to come straight out. So this is why we do the preparation. We do three days of heating it back up then a day of leaving it at room temperature, all, all within a confined UV proof or, or no, no UV environment. Um, and then, yeah, you can, uh, you can conduct the actual test. So yes, we have addressed that. Um, yeah, sorry, go on. I have a further question. You, with regards to the, the actual result of the NPC value, you mentioned that the, it, it's the constituent of the L, A and B values. Mm. The L value is the darkness. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at some of the results that you got there, it could well be that the L was a major factor in increasing the ISO count, mm -hmm. which wasn't necessarily oxidation. Mm -hmm. So you need to address that, I think, as well. Would you agree? Yeah, no, I do agree. Yeah, so li yeah, that, that makes sense. So, well, I suppose that's the whole, the whole issue of what we're seeing here is, um, yeah, the, the inaccuracy of the NPC value with a high luminance value. Um, contributing to that. So, um, no, I do agree. Um, yeah, I suppose in, in future, if I give this a talk again, I could talk about the uh, luminance as a specific value um, and use that as a comparison. Might be interesting to actually go back and plot that information, but yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else? And just with mobile stuff being more susceptible to it because it's cooling down, the machines are always left overnight. Mobile is obviously quite an interesting one. So the process can, can occur very rapidly um, depending on the, the conditions that it's being subjected to. However, the rate at which you guys go through oil and change the oil and the low volumes of oil mean that, yeah, it might occur, but you're more likely just to chuck the oil away. There's no real interest in conditioning, you know, 100 litres of oil or whatever, or 50 litres of oil. So, um, yeah, it, it, it can occur very, uh, very rapidly in mobile environments, but um, typically you wouldn't bother with NPC testing just due to the financial restrictions and the nature of it. I've got a further question. Uh, you use the, the values at 20 degrees C and 80 degrees C mm -hmm. uh, to illustrate the dramatic change in the NPC value. Mm -hmm. What is the transition point where it moves from soluble to insoluble? My understanding is around about 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, I don't have that information to hand. I can I can look into it, um, but yeah, I'm not not 100 percent sure there. I would, in my in my opinion, it would be due to the um, the nature of the varnish. I think obviously you're saying. Yeah, most of it may start to dissolve back into the system or into the solution at 40 degrees, but to me that would depend on the size of the oxidation products themselves. If they got to a point where they're conglomerating very heavily, the larger ones are going to take higher temperatures in order to dissolve back into solution. Um, there needs to be more, yeah, increased temperature. But yeah, I would imagine it would depend on the, the amount of oxidation products in the first place. I'm not sure what the most efficient temperature is or the most change, changing temperature is, the optimum temperature, yeah. Not sure. No, we can do, yeah, again, further, further studies can be done to have a look at that, see in which, which sort of counts differences we get. Good, good points though, thank you. Go. As a company, Sam, how have you uh, counteracted the effect of this electrostatic discharge in your filters then? Is it do you want to sell it, sell filter or fiberglass filter? Oh, it's a trade secret. I'd, yeah, I'd, <laughs> I could tell you, but you know, I'd have to, <laughs> have to sort you out. I'd have to sort you out later. No, yeah, there's a, yeah. So it's just to do with the, the nature of the material. They've they've made a they've made a change to the material that has made it, like I said, more um, in in tandem with the oil itself. So this electron transfer doesn't take place in the first place. So that, that's as much as we can really say. Yeah, they, yeah in terms of, so we know that, again, we know that some of the competitors have, have done things like um, integrating steel fibres or, or similar metallic fibres. Um, but if I go, so if I go back to the Tribelectric series, we'll get there in a sec. Uh, ah. 
but even if you see here things like, um, have I not got it on this one? Yeah, I don't have it on here. I think even things like steel are slightly positively charged. So even in very drastic examples, they still have a electron transfer taking place. Oh, steel is here, sorry. So it still has absolutely no charge. But when you have very low conductivity oils, you can still get this transfer from taking place. But what the metallic infusion does do is it stops it from discharging at the filter itself, which is obviously a fix in some aspects because it's you, you keep your, your particles, um, you, you keep the filtration efficiency, um, but it does mean that there is a risk of migration and then discharging also through the system. That's what we've seen anyway. Do you see many incidences then, uh, I quite honestly don't see as many incidences um, as you may, you may hear or may expect. Um, a, lot about it, a lot of it is, of course, mitigating risk with um, ESD. Um, I don't have any images right here, but you, it's, very, it's very clear when you take apart a filter media, um, if there's very high cases of ESD, there's a huge number of blackening and localized burn holes, it's quite clear. And we do a lot of filters, and I wouldn't, uh, not a very large majority of them, maybe less than 5% or something like that, or even lower than that, are, are actually showing signs of it, even in applications where they have low conductivity oils. And that's because, like I said, there are other factors. So the workload at the filter itself, so greater than 0.1 litre per centimetre squared per minute, um, or alternatively, temperature as well. The relationship with conductivity with temperature is, is um, is, is uh, positive, so as the, as the temperature increases, conductivity of the oil increases, so uh, depending on the system temperature or the temperature at the filter itself, there may be a very reduced risk of this um, discharge. I know we had a, a full grade lubricant in one of our rigs, uh, one of our demo rigs, so we had a plastic turbine flow meter. Mm. You wouldn't believe the cracking and the sparking. And the it just went off, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is, and that is. Yeah. <laughs> so we, yeah, we, that's what we do. We take these demo rigs around. But um, going back to mobile, actually, on the, on the topic of um, plastic, obviously, this is where we can see electrostatic discharge taking place in mobile environments. You think things like rubber hosing, um, uh, plastic tanks. There's a very high um, charge capacity there available, and, and it, it is a serious risk of this discharge taking place. So obviously we, in, in a lot of industry, we talk about the effect that it has on the oil because it's going to cost you a lot to replace the oil. Um, but it can also do it, it can also have impact on electron, uh, sorry, electrical controls. So electric, uh, electro hydraulic control systems. So sparking could have impacts on the functionality there, um, as well as, like I said, just completely degrading the oil and using up the filters. Yeah. Do you actually market your filters as anti-static then? Uh, they're called stat-free filters, so yeah, I suppose you, you could say <coughs> anti-static. Um, it's a difficult one because uh, the guy that came up with most of the development for us, a guy called Dr. John Dukowski, uh who's a sort of genius bloke in, in, uh, in uh, Heidak, Germany, he's our technical director on, on this side of things, he um, actually did a study on reverse polarity where they they made the filter, the, they made it so uh, non-conductive, it went the other way and it started arcing, the filter started down receiving electrons from the oil, um, so they made it even, yeah, even uh, further down on this series, so it went even lower than oil and it started uh, doing a reverse polarities. That's the effect that was observed by mistake when they did it originally. So that's where our stat-free media, so we actually have a stat-free media and a statex media. Stat-free media is um, sort of the middle ground and then Originally, when we found this um, reverse polarity, it seemed like an issue, but now where we're having even lower conductivity oils, having this um, even, even lower level of um, charge capacity, or, or should I say electron transfer, actually becomes even more beneficial. You don't get this yeah, build-up taking place. But again, it's very system specific. It's, for me, it's a lot of it's a lot a lot of things need to be working in tandem in order to see this effect take place. And it's quite easy for us to simulate in test rigs and this has got to be a, a big issue like going fluid transfer, hasn't it? When you, when you transfer fluid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Anybody else? No? Thank you very much for listening guys. Thank you.